Here's a headline from this week. According to the Anti-Defamation League, anti-Semitism is on a historic rise. There were more than 10,000 incidents in the past year in the United States of America. That's more for any previous period since 1979 when the ADL started tracking these incidents. We've been hearing a lot of it happening on college campuses, but it is not limited to there. It seriously is a problem. This is Justice by Design. I'm Kimberly Atkins Store. This is a podcast where we tackle some of the biggest issues facing Americans, including anti Semitism, and talk about solutions of how to fix that. And to talk today, I am thrilled to be joined by Kenneth Stern. Kenneth Stern is director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate, an author and also a noted attorney. Ken, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And Ken, tell us a little bit about what you do at BARD. Well, at BARD, I direct the BARD Center for the Study of Hate, which is an interdisciplinary effort to look at human hatred, how it exists, why it exists, how we get into the us versus them buckets, how sometimes it leads to, you know, uh, terrible examples of dehumanization and demonization. Um, And the the basic idea is there's a lot of different things ideas there already in social psychology and history, religion, other fields, but we don't sort of harness it in a way to give us better answers of how do you deal with hatred? How do you understand it? And that's that's the, the purpose of the, the growing field of hate studies. And I know you have talked and written about and studied anti-Semitism uh, And at this point in time, I also sort of want to start a conversation because we're looking for solutions here. And I realized in thinking about this that we can't talk about a solution to the problem unless we define it clearly. And that's been one of your jobs too, helping to define what anti-Semitism is. Tell us a little bit about that and what what is the definition? Well, it's a great question. And, the you know, I've been working on issues of anti-Semitism actually since the 1980s. Um, and part of how I look at anti-Semitism is that while it has unique characteristics, as all types of bigotry uh, and racism do, uh, it's a subset of the human capacity to define who's us and who's them. Uh, And, you know, if we don't recognize that it's, you know, it's not the only example of bigotry out there, then we lose so much about how uh, it actually manifests. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in short, the, the, and there are a bunch of different definitions and I can talk about them, but the common core that they have about where anti-Semitism is at its most significant is having two um, two aspects. One is it's a conspiracy theory that uh, alleges that Jews are conspiring to harm humanity, and it gives an explanation for what goes wrong in the world, from the death of Jesus to the you know plagues in the Middle Ages to um, political upheavals to some of the things that we've heard about, even you know Jews controlling the weather, those types of things. That's, that that's the core of it. There's a there's an evil aspect of Jews trying to somehow harm uh, non-Jewish people. The great replacement theory is part of that too, the old idea of Jews you know, conspiring. Um, the challenge about definitions is much more um, nuanced. I was the lead drafter of something that was called the EUMC Working Definition of Anti-Semitism, um, that is now called the IRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, same, same text for all intents and purposes. But the, the reason for that was that when there was an uptick in attacks on Jews after the uh, collapse of the peace process in the Second Intifada, there was a series of attacks on Jews in uh, Europe in particular, very much like we've seen an increase in, in hate crimes against Jews uh, now when there's shooting in the Middle East. Yeah. And there was a group that was supposed to do uh, an analysis of, of hate crimes uh, against Jews and the sort of temperature of the the uh, anti-Semitism in Europe. And it had uh, a report that came out that was pretty right in terms of what it found, but it said that we have a, we have a problem. The problem is 
that all the data collectors in different parts of Europe didn't have a common sort of song sheet to play off of. They were looking at different things. So they wanted to have some common point of reference. And also there was an issue where they said, well, if, if somebody has attacks a Jew uh, as a stand-in for an Israeli and they don't have, uh, you know, a reservoir of anti-Semitic tropes and, and theories that are driving them, that's lamentable, but it's not anti-Semitism. And I thought that was particularly nuts because if you attack a, you know, black person in the South in the 50s or 60s, because you think of these stereotypes about black people, that's racism. But if you're upset with something political and you attack the same person, that's not. So okay. it was a, it was an effort to, to clarify that the intent to pick somebody to be a victim of a crime based on who they are and not what, whether they really hate it or not. So that was the, the basis of the definition. The, the thing that, that, that's distressing to me, it's that it's been used as a way to weaponize it against uh, pro-Palestinian speech. Some of the speech I don't like either, mm -hmm. but it's been used as a sort of a shortcut. Yeah. And that, that, yeah, uh, and, and I, I could explain a little bit more about why that's a problem fighting. Yeah, please, know. please. So anti-Semitism really is a system of thought. And, you know, the, one example that I've used is clearly the hate crime against the, you know, Tree of Life synagogue. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly anti-Semitic. Um, but it was the driving factor of that was the, the drumbeat of anti-immigrant rhetoric at the time about invasions over the southern border. And there had been an event that was pro-immigration at that, at that synagogue. Nobody would think that the shooting at the Walmart in El Paso a few months later, where Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were killed, was an act of anti-Semitism. But the two shooters had nearly identical ideologies. They just chose different targets. Mm. So what worries me about the use of the definition is it narrows things down to saying, is this something we're going to put on this side of the ledger or that side of the ledger as an expression? Um, and it, it basically blinds us to looking how anti-Semitism works as a system, as an ideology, as a theology, all the different drivers into anti-Semitic movements uh, and ways of thinking. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the, you know, the observations from hate studies is when people get into these buckets where their, um, you know, their identity is tethered to an issue of social justice or injustice, mm -hmm. they crave simplicity, they crave, you know, uh, sort of binary thinking, everything's good, the other side is evil, mm -hmm. uh, they crave certainty. And I, I worry that, you know, because that's a human characteristic of people who hate, I think it's also a human characteristic of people who fight hate. And when we go down those simple roads, it's usually the wrong answer. I really, really appreciate that uh, statement so much, that search for simplicity and also the use of buckets, because I fear a lot. Uh, I certainly know, see that happening um, in the discourse around uh, even problem solvers who are trying to mm -hmm. stop and address anti-Semitism. And, and I think I worry that that could be counterproductive for a number of reasons. You know, you, you have, for example, and I will do another story specifically on Islamophobia because that's its own thing with its own origins and its own considerations. Mm -hmm. But just as a juxtaposition, it is, you, you, there was a, an atmosphere, there still is an atmosphere, I think. If you say one thing, you are labeled as the enemy of the other thing. And it's very black and white. You are you say something in sympathy to people who were killed in Gaza, and you are labeled anti-Semitic. You say something uh, about Israel having a right to exist, and you are anti-Palestinian, which is absolutely ridiculous, and it mm -hmm. is false. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about still talking about definitions, how we define it. How can you, for example, um, express? Is it possible to express? consternation about policy that uh, the government in Israel is taking and not be anti-Semitic? Is it possible to express, um, to your point about the politics surrounding this? Because there's a difference between that and what I grew up thinking of what anti-Semitism is. And I think there is, uh, particularly to non-Jewish folks, either uh, uh, 
an anger that of being called uh, labeled in a certain way or fear of being labeled in a certain way, and they either don't engage at all or they engage in a way that's counterproductive? That was a big question, but yeah. um, help no. me sort of unpeel this onion. Sure. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, people are looking for, um, they're hunting for speech that they want to um, either applaud or to um, oppose. I mean, we saw some of that around the the missteps of presidential statements after October 7th, where people were, you know, saying this is, you know, doesn't support Palestinians or this doesn't sufficiently uh, condemn Hamas or yeah. I thought it was, you know, got to the point where it was so bizarre that people who even agreed with some of the statements were criticizing it for not using the words that they would choose. I mean, people were hunting for, you know, sort of purity on these things. Clearly, one can be critical of, of Israel without being anti-Semitic. Most, most American Jews, for one reason or another, you know, not liking uh, Bibi Netanyahu, or other, can be very critical of Israel and not be anti-Semitic. Where it becomes difficult is the question around, around anti-Zionism. I'm a Zionist. Um, I believe in Israel's right to exist, um, but I'm not going. And I disagree with anti-Zionism for a bunch of, of reasons, and I think it's correlated. One could say with with some of the um, you know things that we've seen that have been anti-Semitic, and there are times where it certainly is just sort of cut and pasted for classic anti-Semitism. You know, instead of Jews doing things, it's Israel doing things. So one of the the complaints where uh, in, on one of the college campuses, legal cases where somebody was uh, alleging that somebody was you know, sort of hunting for, quote, Zionist sounding names. Well, they weren't talking about Pastor Hagee. You know, they, they were, they were, it was clearly what that was. But, but there are reasons why one can be anti-Zionist without being anti-Semitic. And let me give you two. Uh, for a Palestinian uh, who says, wait a minute, this isn't about you know, Jews, this is about what happened to us when, you know, the Jewish community was reconstituting in the, from the late 1800s on and what it meant to us. And they don't believe in a, you know, a Jewish state. They believe in a state for all the people. And so therefore they would, you know, not want to have Jewish. Son. I may disagree with them. I think that even before October 7th, the Jews are never going to give up that connection to the land and their right to control. But that's not because they're hating Jews, not because they're believing in Jewish conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Second group, inside the Jewish community, and this is part of, of the complexity of what's happening that people outside the community might not perceive, um, there's a battle inside the community about whether support for Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state is uh, a requirement to be inside the Jewish tent. And there are ultra-Orthodox Jews, Satmar Jews, who believe that you can't have a state until the Messiah comes. And I think everybody in the community would say, well, they're, they're part of the community. We just disagree with them on that theological basis. There are an small, um, very much a minority, but an increasing number of young Jews, many of whom were the children and grandchildren people that were very involved in Jewish life, um, who went to Jewish day school and so forth and said, wait a minute, I know about what Judaism teaches me about how do we treat the stranger. I know what Judaism teaches me about how do we repair the world. I can't justify the existence of Israel as a Jewish state. I can't justify Zionism with those things that my religion lead me to. I disagree with them in terms of the politics. I can discuss that with them. I'm not going to call them anti-Semites. They're mm -hmm. not, you know, they're not mm -hmm. the David Dukes of the world. Right. Right. This is really helpful in um, or understanding you can't take something so complex and treat it in that binary way where you decide which side you're on and, and condemn the, the other side. Now, we're both lawyers. So when we are looking at things like what is happening on college campuses, I think that's also an area that is rife for confusion, right? Including from people who are trying to denounce hate, who are trying to protect people from that kind of hate. And I'll give you an example. I saw on social media a post from the ACLU uh, about a court order that stopped the University of Maryland uh, from trying mm -hmm. to ban all expressive events on October 7th. Now, most lawyers would hear that and say, mm. yeah, that is a public university. Yeah. Um, 
this is expressive activity by definition of the ban, the First Amendment says you cannot do that. And the ACLU was one of the groups that Mm -hmm. um, sued to block it, and a court actually did prohibit the school from doing that. And in response to that post on social media were a ton of people saying they were going to stop donating to the organization, that they were uh, essentially supporting hate and and everything that was wrong. And as a lawyer, someone who would just decry anyone being um, or being targeted by bigotry on any college campus, thought, absolutely not. <laughs> this is not the way to go. So sort of talk from people who think that supporting the right to have a protest where nasty things can be said is not by itself hateful. It's actually necessary to protect speech. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, neither of us nor I think anybody else with a law degree is going to be able to decide, okay, what speech is okay and what speech isn't just on the matter of expression, right? right. You can find it hateful. Um, you can find it disturbing. Um, but once you start you know, especially giving the government the ability to decide what speech is okay and what isn't. I mean, we've had horrible experiences with that. You know, World War One with people that were opposed to the war, the McCarthy era, and so forth. Mm-hmm. You can't go down that road. That doesn't mean you ignore the the speech. And you know, two points. One thing is, I think what, what's getting lost in a lot of the discussion about the campus, is, and some of this was the hearings in the House uh, contributed to that, is, you know, what kind of expressions are going to get you in trouble just for expressing them? And, you know, the, the distinction is between, on one hand, harassment, intimidation, true threats, bullying, discrimination, all of which, I don't care if you're in a protected class or not, those things should not happen to college students. Versus hearing things that may cut you to the core, and if it's just an expression, that's a, a you know something that can be countered. There are ways of doing that to to counter speech. There are ways. I, I um, years to give you an example. Years ago, um, there was a march that was going to happen in uh, Western Montana that was threatening the Jewish community and the human rights workers. And the people were saying, "Well, stop the march. There are armed skinheads who were going to come." And Montana was an open carry state. And what we, we did, I was running a small foundation. We worked with the um, human rights groups there and had people make pledges tied to conditional pledges tied to how long these guys would march. So it gave a disincentive for them to march because they would, in fact, have been raising money for things they would have detested, anti-bias education, mm-hmm. police mm-hmm. training and so forth. So it gave people something concrete to do. It gave people there the sense that they were supported and didn't violate free speech rights or turned it on its head. So there are a bunch of things that can be done, but people sometimes think, oh, we're either going to stop the speech or condone it. And there are lots of other things that can be done, but get lost in this idea of censorship. In terms of um, people taking away money, look, people can give money wherever they want. But I think if you have a respect for free speech and what it means, and the idea that what we want to do is use uh, our speech rights to identify the hate, to teach about hate, to get people to understand it better. Those are things that that should be supported. So when you know the people were starting to give to pull away money after October seventh from some of the schools because they were upset about how the schools acted, I said, "It's your money. You can do what you want. But if you're really caring about the academic environment, contribute more. Find more hate studies programs. Teaches." Teach courses on anti-Semitism, teach courses on hate and Islamophobia, teach courses uh, on um, academic freedom and the importance of free speech. There are lots of things that that could be supportive to help out of it, but people just want to use a hammer to suppress things they don't like, and that's always counterproductive. Yeah, and and to that point, even if it is on a college campus, the school is not without recourse. Mm-hmm. They, I'm sure they have, every school that I went to, public or private, there was a code of conduct. Uh, there were consequences if you violated that. I couldn't bully somebody. I couldn't, certainly couldn't make threats to them uh, or, or, you know, racially slur them on campus. Um, there are things to do that, but prior restraint that that would take away the ability to protest, which is also built into the First Amendment, to be able to counter that speech with the speech that is correct. But that doesn't mean that that leaves people 
un protected that's right um and, and i think that's the gut you people people don't want kids to go to school and feel unsafe they don't want kids to go to school and be terrorized i totally understand yeah. that and i was too frustrated by administrators that didn't seem to be creating a, a, a bigotry plea bigotry free campus for their students but um there's a certain way to do that that's that right. keeps all the interests in mind. That's right. And and also says to students, look, you're gonna you're in college, you're gonna hear things you're gonna find disturbing. We're gonna help you process it, we're gonna help you understand yeah. it, we're gonna protect you from true threats, but you're gonna get here. I mean, a lot of Jewish students who are Zionists, like I am, hear anti Zionist stuff. And for them it, it it it's cuts to the core as if they you know, somebody was criticizing their Judaism. I get it. Yeah, it's difficult. Universities can help people you know, navigate that and understand. I mean, there are courses that I put in, uh, in the sort of last chapter of my book that help people understand the complexities and to have the emotional empathy and the intellectual curiosity to uh, understand why people have these strongly divergent, you know, points of view. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, think about it on a campus, students, None of them are going to solve Israel Palestine. All of yeah. them have the ability to to you know look out for their fellow students. And aren't you curious if you're on a college and you hear some you're a college and you hear somebody saying something and you know this person is otherwise friendly, you see them in the classes, but on this you, you come down to not only thinking they're wrong but perhaps evil. Um, wouldn't you want to know more about why they think things that way? Yeah. And there, there were ways to. Do, I mean, there's a. I'm going to do a webinar uh, with with um, some people from Carnegie Mellon next month that are using AI mm. in a very creative way on this issue and others to get people to uh, discuss in a rational way, sort of like John Stuart Mill on on AI about how to have different, you know, difficult discussions and listen to the other side better. Um, and so there are, there are lots of things that, you know, can be done, but when we just go to censorship because it sounds satisfying, we miss all these other things. I love that. I, I'm terrified of AI, so I'm always, yeah. uh, I always love to see examples of it used in a tangibly positive mm -hmm. way. So that's a really good example. So I'm going to ask a question that I, uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time because I'm sometimes, um, I don't love being asked this question in a different context. So when, when, um, you know, during the Black Lives Matter protests mm -hmm. or, or when we're talking about ending systemic racism, um, which I spend a lot of time mm -hmm. uh, reporting on and talking mm -hmm. about, I am often asked by people who are not Black, how can I be an ally? And I both love and hate that question because on the one hand, Black people did not create the mm -hmm. structure right. in America that is leading to systemic uh, racism. So it shouldn't be up to us to fix it. It should be. Mm -hmm other people should feel invested, all Americans should feel just as invested in that as black people do. But on the other hand, it can be taxing as the person on the brunt of mm -hmm. uh, a member of the community on the brunt of these policies to always be the one that has to explain it. But at the same time, I know I have listeners and I am count myself in this group of people who do want to be allies in the fight against anti-Semitism, because I do believe that is in all of our interests too, mm -hmm. but we don't always know how. And the problem with that is that makes people reticent to try. They sort of stay out of it. They don't say things. I hear all the time people who are afraid to speak, especially given the conflict that is going on in the Middle East, to try to be even an ally, to try to express support, to try to do what they can to end anti-Semitism. So I will ask you the lamentable question, but with that sort of in that sure. framing, how can folks be an ally in the fight against anti-Semitism? I think there's, you know, lots of different things that people can do, um, you know, on a personal level, uh, if you know people who you think are, are feeling sort of stressed by the moment, and it's not only, you know, Jews, I mean, they're Arabs, Palestinians, Muslims, have been doxing and other things too, any sort of human being that you think, you know, maybe just ask them an open-ended question, how are you doing? And, you know, what can I, what can I do to, to help? Don't be afraid uh, of engaging, I would say. Um, and, and then, you know, secondly, um, if you see somebody that that even on your side of the of a political conflict that's behaving badly, uh, either trying to suppress speech or trying to diminish somebody else, you know, I think that's an important thing for all of us to do to interrupt it. 
Um, I'll give you a, a different example of this. When I was teaching a class at Bard on, on anti-Semitism and starting with talking about how people hate as a background to it, I had a student, this is 2016, very much of a Hillary supporter, missed classes that she shouldn't have, you know, even though I told her she couldn't. Um, obviously she was very upset with the election loss. And a week later she came into my office and was really upset about how some of her barred students were colleagues were treating the women in the ba- mail room who were Trump supporters. Mm. And I thought that was a real human. She got the idea of how do you, you counteract hate? You yeah. recognize that you don't, you know, write off other people who you strongly disagree on this issue or any other. The other thing that I would say is, you know, it's, to me, the fight against anti-Semitism requires uh, a strong democracy. If you look through it, you, history of fighting racism of any type, you need strong democratic institutions. You need uh, free press. You need an uh, independent judiciary. Um, you know, those are things that to me are critically important. So find ways to, you know, to support that too. Um, it, that's not just supporting Jews, it's supporting the framework in, in which uh, anti-Semitism is less likely uh, to grow. Yeah. What about um, building bridges with other communities, communities of faith, uh, cultural communities. I mean, one thing that I fear and we have been seeing is when you tend to see a rise, first of all, it's not just anti-Semitism that is on the rise, other forms of bigotry are uh, on the rise too. And it is precisely during those times that you see increased uh, tension between those groups, which always worries me. And I try to remind Mm -hmm. people, listen, when people are being pit against one another, keep an eye on who benefits from that. And it's not the people in either one of those groups. And we see, we've seen over history schisms between the black community and the Jewish community. Right now there's a schism between Arab Americans and Jewish Americans. Um, How do you build bridges to other community members in order to combat that those divisions that can only serve to elevate the interests of those who are fomenting that kind of hate? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think, you know, there are a number, number of things uh, that could be done. One thing I, I'll mention is that, um, you know, the Bard Center for the Study of Hate, along with the Montana Human Rights Network and Western States Center, we put out a community guide uh, for opposing hate, um, that sort of nuts and bolts of how do you build coalitions and how do you work with journalists and how do you work with politicians and how do you you know respond in particular scenarios? But part of that really was just how to maximize the connections between communities and build those those strong bonds. Um, there have been you know challenges certainly after October seventh. Uh, we're putting out a new book next year that's taking from hate studies experts guides to how community groups and NGOs that focus on hatred, you know, how they should be working, taking the the ideas from hate studies. And I basically asked these people, if you were running one of these NGOs and ADL, Southern Poverty Law Center or something, knowing what you know, what would you do? What wouldn't you do? And why one of the essays is from somebody who writes uh, about memory and how memories work and, um, you know, looking at South Africa um, about the black community there and the Jewish community all having experiences with, with crimes of hate and then working together in coalition to build a hate crime system in South Africa. That unfortunately has not survived October 7th because uh, it's a challenge of how memories function differently and then people can shift them around. On the flip side of that, um, where I, I started and ended my you know book on the conflict over the conflict was a scenario from Spokane, Washington years ago where there was a, um, one of the Aryan nations had been like the big you know, hateful group for many, many, many uh, years and was closed down partly by a lawsuit, but also because people were working on the ground together. And the problem was that the, the, there was a peace and justice group that had a pro boycott of Israel webpage and the Jewish community, which was also integral in closing down the Aryan nations, uh, was calling them anti-Semites and they didn't work together. And they weren't even in the same room. And there were things happening still in the community, including things like on a Martin Luther King Day parade, somebody put a, a remote controlled backpack 
bomb with fishing weights soaked in uh, rat poison, anticoagulant. Ugh. Thank God it didn't go off. So these folks had enough insight to think, we're not going to solve Israel-Palestine, but we have real problems in our community that we have to work on together. Um, and we better figure out a way to get a vocabulary to speak about this issue and why it divides us so we can work together and understand our differences. And they put together a program and they're st they survived October 7th and they're still working together because they had this other goal in mind wow. that was really important to them. And to realize that, that you know, the, 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 the challenges are significant um, across the board and we can't let differences on this, even though they're very hard are felt and you know people feel hurt when there are these differences we can't let them stop us from doing all the other work that we have to do wow i'm not sure uh i've had in a podcast episode yet that had as many tangible solutions uh and, and examples of how to make uh this actually work as this one ken stern i am so grateful for you for taking the time to talk to me today oh my pleasure thank you so much for having me that was such a great and important conversation. And what I will do is put in the show notes a link to the Bard Center for the Study of Hate in case anybody wants to know more about the work that Ken and others are doing there. I'm Kimberly Atkinstore. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Justice by Design. You can watch on YouTube at the Politicon channel. You can also follow it wherever you get your podcast. Tell a friend to do so as well and give a five-star review because that helps other people find the podcast. Talk to you next week. I'm Kim Atkinstore.